Hello my friends, my name is Artur Rehi and I am an Estonian soldier. USA is a superpower, we all know that. How did it become one? Armchair historian has an answer for us. I don't know the answer, but I think it has something to do with the Second World War and the post-war economy and loans it made to Europe. While Europe and the rest of the world was recovering from war, USA was skyrocketing up and literally going to the moon. <laughs> the armchair historian brings us a very interesting video. Go and get your Estonian YouTuber cup, maybe some snacks and let's enjoy this cool history. But there are also Patreons. People without who I cannot do what I do. Patreons make it possible for me to be a YouTuber because YouTube is not a regular job. There's no fixed pay. If YouTube revenue fails, I have Patreon. If I wouldn't, I would starve. I wanna thank three new Patreons. We have Joshua Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter, for becoming a Patreon. We have Don Garcia. Gracias, Mr. Garcia. And finally, we have Christopher Kirk. Thank you, Christopher, for becoming a patron. If you want to support the channel, if you like my style, you like these history videos, US military videos, consider becoming a patron. Link is in the description below. All right, let's go, my friends. It's morning in America. All over the newly built suburbs, men who just months earlier were fighting in Europe or Asia are climbing into their cars and heading to work. Whoa, homeless vet, please help. In the cities, returning veterans crowd lecture Dark halls side. universities and colleges, receiving advanced educations they never thought, thought possible. And, and all on Uncle Sam's dime. Antidepressants. Manufacturing booms under a tsunami of private investment. The lean times of the Great Depression fading from memory as stores are flooded with a bevy of American-made appliances, gadgets, and goods. And abroad, American <sighs> servicemen keep watch over lands from Sounds Cuba good. to Korea. A new world has come into being. An American one. American world, boy. World of barbecue and guns and freedom to shoot whoever you want, wherever you want. America. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. In today's video, we will examine how the United States went from an isolationist democracy uninterested in world affairs to one of the two superpowers spreading their influence around the world. First, we yeah. look at the effects that entering the Second World War had on the American economy. Next, we'll look at how America placed herself in a preeminent position in the post-war world. And lastly, we'll take a look at the political maneuvering, economic luck, and the cloak and dagger exercises it took to get there. So now, let's look at where America was before entering the Second World War. Yeah, US has worked so hard to be where it is. He's like a self-made man who has worked really hard and worked himself up. Just a very hard-working nation and a very ambitious nation. You have to have ambition as people to take over the world. And the US has ambition. It's everywhere, including Estonia. Woohoo! We love you guys here. US troops are stationed in Estonia in very small numbers. I think it's below a thousand. But we love you guys here. We need you here because otherwise Russia would do something stupid. So Mr. Biden, if you can, stay in Estonia. We good. The stock market crash of 1929 and the resulting Great Depression were especially hard on the United States. In a desperate attempt to revitalize the economy, President Herbert Hoover signed the 1930 Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, which raised customs duties to such an extent that imported goods became unaffordable to all but the wealthiest Americans. Instead of spurring domestic purchasing and production as intended, the Smoot-Hawley tariffs succeeded only in further damaging the world's economy. As other nations passed retaliatory tariffs against American exports, international trade plummeted by 65%, leading to the full collapse of banks in America and Europe, as the world economy only increased its tailspin. 
When Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president in 1933, he immediately set about implementing his New Deal program to strengthen America's economy and get people back to work. It was one of the greatest strategies of their time, the Great Depression. We don't remember anything about this. Most people are dead who lived back then. We have only a few people living right now who actually were old enough to understand the Depression. The Great Depression ended the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties, time of party, jazz hand dance, I don't know, flappers, all of that stuff. Don't know much about it, but it's a weird era. Everybody spent a lot of money and then the Depression hit and everybody was poor. Estonia got out of that depression, it also affected us, but when we got out of it, the Soviet Union took over, immediately. They occupied us, so we remained poor until 91, 1991. Then we jumped into the US capitalism and oh baby, it tastes good. Oh, capitalism is good, let me tell you that. He insured Americans' bank accounts through the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, implemented the Social Security program to provide income to the disabled and elderly, and brought thousands onto the federal payroll through public works projects. While these programs certainly benefited countless Americans, the effects of Roosevelt's New Deal paled in comparison to those of America joining the Second World War. With the sleeping giant awakened, the United States saw a tectonic shift in economic activity, between the draft and the industrial sector experiencing a massive demand for new laborers to produce war material, unemployment plummeted overnight. America's women also stepped into the breach, taking jobs traditionally reserved for men. Government contracts and investment spurred continued growth, and America's economy roared back to life through victory in 1945. So the Second World War was something that brought America out of the Great Depression. If it wasn't for the war, if the US didn't join, maybe it would have taken so much longer to get out. And also the isolationist policy might have carried on. And we wouldn't have US as a superpower now. So it is all about the Second World War. It helped US out of the Depression and it brought US to the world. And the world is thankful. Welcome back, my friends, to the Estonian Soldier Hat competition. We have five new points to put on the boards. And it will be a close one between Texas, Arizona and California. And there's Florida also in there somewhere. Maybe Florida men may, will make a comeback. First of all, we have Gabriel Lewis. Not from the US though. This one is from the ally of the US, New Zealand. New Zealand already has one point, so it will be the second one. Two points for New Zealand, baby, yeah! We have Brant Courier. city is called Eaton Town, so it's not a city, it's a town, I guess, because it has the name town in its name. This one is not from New Zealand, but New Jersey, yeah, US state. Seven points for New Jersey. Way to go, my man. Next name I'm going to butcher. Because of the Estonian language. Kene Macpherson. Kene Macpherson. City is called Eureka. Eureka. Reka means a truck, a huge truck in Estonian, so. You truck. It's in California. Oh, putting California and Florida both to 17, sharing the third place. 17s, 17s. Either of them gets one more point and it will be the second place. Now we have a namesake, Arthur Ponilla. Oh, hey, another Arthur. Cool name, man. City is called San Diego and that is also from California. Wow! That puts California to third place with 18 points and Florida will fall to the fourth place. Florida men get to work. 18 to California, two more, and it'll be on the second place with Arizona. Maybe a little a bit more and California could take on Texas. I would love to see that. We have another point from Arthur Bonilla, a separate order. Not in the same order, but a separate one. That's how we chose. Well, Arthur, you are a crazy lad. You got two hats and two separate orders. I like it. San Diego, California. 19 to California. Oh, it's climbing high. It's taking on Texas. I can feel it. Oh, I can feel it in the air. Let's do one more point. 
Finally, we have Yoa Iacono. It's Joey Iacono, but I say Yoa because that's how we say it in Estonia. Exeter. Yeah, that's the town. Exeter. Rhode Island. And that was the second ever point to Rhode Island. You're doing great with the competition. I like it. Let's keep it going. I want to see. Um, I love you Texans, but I want to see you go down from the first place because you always win. You're such a powerful state. I want to see some other state take the place for a little, little while. Maybe you will not see. let me see that because Texans are patriotic. But let's see. Thank you for getting the hats, my friends. This truly helps me out. Let's go back to the video. Oh, baby, a nuclear bomb. Arguably, the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki marked a new chapter in American history. The isolationist America of old perished in the nuclear holocaust that ended the Second World War. The United States was the only allied country to emerge from the war with her economy not only intact, but thriving. Yeah. As government contracts ended and subsidies were withdrawn, private investment. It should be noted, however, that America still experienced downturns. There were four recessions between 1949 and 1960, and unemployment reached its head once more in the post-war world. So it took a little more time to get out of the depression, but you think about it. Most of the Soviet Union infrastructure was destroyed and bombed because Nazis occupied most the European part, which where most of the Soviet people lived actually. Most of Europe's infrastructure was bombed and destroyed. Asia, the same deal. Only US. Britain was destroyed. US had only intact economy, infrastructure and ambitions. A lot of money to throw out to make Europe pay the money back very slowly and, you know, close on its connections with Europe. Very smart move. Investment took their place. Consumers were able to purchase goods and appliances that had long been outside of their economic reach. And they used their new economic power to spur more and more spending and growth. This transition from a war economy to a consumerist one was the bedrock of America's post-war preeminence but none of it would be possible without the influx of working age men coming home from the war, ready to start their new lives in this revitalized country. Returning GIs stepped off their boats, planes, and trains to find an America totally different from the one they had left. Many would remember the mistreatment their fathers and grandfathers had endured after the First World War, when they were given a pittance of a bonus and a train fare home. But things would be different this time. The GI Bill of Rights was signed into law by President Roosevelt in 19... There were hundreds of thousands of veterans coming home. With one year, like, you get half a million extra manpower in your country. They all come back from Europe. And they are traumatized from the head. Really, if you go to war, you, you will get traumatized. It's almost impossible to go to war and come back without anything broken here. It's okay. It happens to everybody who goes. Veterans who have seen battle, who have seen death, they need help. They need bonuses. They need treatment. They need the government to take care of them. That's what they need. And if there are so many of them, you can't ignore them. I don't know how is the veteran situation in USA right now. Some of you say veterans are treated horribly. Some of you say they're treated good. If I was in the US, I saw special lines for the veterans. They could cut in lines. They could go faster in the airports. They had special lounges. For me, it seemed like they're treated good, but also in Hollywood I saw so many homeless veterans, homeless, drug addicts, so the picture is mixed. I don't know. That's for you to decide. Put it in the comments. I want to read your first-hand experience. How are American veterans treated nowadays? 1944 and promised myriad benefits to returning veterans, from federal guarantees on home loans to subsidized university or vocational education. Between 1944 and 1956, 7.8 million veterans went to college or trade schools with GI million. Bill subsidies, while 2.4 million home loans were guaranteed by the Veterans Administration. It is so hard to get a home loan, to get a mortgage. It's impossible to get it. And if, if a state helps you to get one, you're lucky. Otherwise, you have to work so hard. Right now in Estonia also, it's, to get a mortgage, you have to work so freaking hard. And if the state helps the vets, 
Oh, that's good. That's a big bonus. These loans were used to buy houses in the newly built suburbs, where a plethora of new single-family homes drew people from the cities to these new developments. This was the start of American car culture, and the suburban population began commuting from their new homes to their new jobs in the cities on the new interstate highway system. Life was good in the new America, but there were many excluded from this newfound prosperity. Black veterans faced a brand new war on the home front. Their first battle was obtaining GI benefits. One of the key compromises that ensured the original law's passing was the condition that aid be administered by state governments rather than a federal agency. This meant that segregationist Jim Crow laws overshadowed the promises of the GI Bill, and aid was often contingent on skin color. Separate but unequal schools set what few black veterans were able to use their benefits up for failure, while the majority were simply intimidated into never collecting what they were due. Black unemployment was also endemic throughout the 1950s and 1960s, with what work that was available paying only the smallest of wages and offering no chance for upward mobility. America's women found themselves in a battle of their own. Hired in droves to fill the factories and provide support for the armed services, in the minds of many, the end of the war meant the end of Rosie the Riveter. They were laid off en masse from their wartime jobs to make way for returning servicemen, and those who were kept on the payroll were placed in part-time clerical jobs with no union protections. Oh no. Women in uniform were denied GI Bill benefits outright, and magazines began running ads and opinion pieces designed to pressure America's women to leave the workforce and settle down as homemakers. What? This was the dawn of the- See, for me as an Estonian, it's so hard to understand. Women can do the job as good as men, it, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Of course, if you need to lift very heavy stuff, then yeah, you, you need a man. Physically, they are stronger usually, but this is not the case. If you need to use your brain, women are as smart as men. That's how it is. So I, I don't understand why they, they have to do this. This was a, a very sexist world back then. I hope it's better now. The nuclear family and the beginning of the baby boom, and America asked its women to do a different kind of duty. With its domestic house in order, the United States began to make changes abroad as well. In July of 1944, the United States invited representatives of the Allied Nations to Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, where the U.S. Treasury Department proposed an international bank and trade control network to promote worldwide cooperation and prevent the economic brinkmanship that led the world to war. And with that, the International Monetary Fund was born. But this was only a preamble to a much greater effort at American international influence. President Roosevelt believed the world needed a strong international body to prevent future conflict, and such a body would need strong leadership, in his view, American leadership. Roosevelt gathered- Oh yeah, I and mean, it's all about American interests, and I am all with that, because without such a big nation looking out for the smaller one, without that union, I think they're talking about NATO here. Estonia wouldn't be nothing, Lithuania, Latvia wouldn't be nothing. We depend on NATO for our independence. NATO is the thing that uh, drove Soviet Union to the collapse. It couldn't, it couldn't do the arms race anymore against NATO and the US. So US is looking out for their interests, but it also is my interest because it protects my country. So I am all for US interests. Representatives of the United States, United Kingdom, Soviet Union, and Republic of China at Dumbarton Oaks, a historic residence outside of Washington, D.C. And from August to October of 1944, they laid the groundwork for the United Nations. One year UN. later, on October 24th, 19... Not NATO, UN, I'm sorry, but the talk still applies to NATO. 45, the UN was officially established in San Francisco. Honoring the wishes of his predecessor, President Harry S. Truman personally signed the US Charter for the United States and pressured Congress to ratify it. But America had more than economic and political means to promote her interests. The US never truly demobilized, and she was unafraid to use her military might or shadowy intelligence service to spread her influence. The only roadblock to that influence, in America's view, was communism. 
The yeah. Soviets had already huh. reorganized Communism. much of Eastern Europe after the war, and were busy converting these new socialist republics into buffers between them and the rest of the world. Through investment in the Marshall Plan and propaganda coups like the Berlin Airlift, America sought to combat Soviet influence on the PR front while simultaneously putting her thumb on the scales of elections in the newly created post-war states and elsewhere. On the Asian front, America was busy rebuilding the shattered empire of Japan into a- America rewrote Japan's constitution. America made Japan, basically. Out of the empire of the rising sun, was tr transported to this kawaii state we have nowadays. And this kawaii state is very powerful. It's leading the world in robotics, it has a lot of people, and it's, it has quite a strong military. It could be stronger, but the constitution actually limits the military. That's what the US wrote into it, that Japan only is supposed to have a defensive military. US made Japan. US made the whole post-war world that was allied with the US. They made it. They funded it financed it, and gave the ideas of democracy and freedom. I love it. A bulwark against the Red Spread in East Asia. On September 8, 1951, the Empire of Japan and the United States signed the Treaty of San Francisco, which officially ended the state of war between Japan and the US. One of the core tenets of the treaty was Japan's total disarmament, with Japan ceding land and resources for the establishment of American garrisons, some of which still stand today. Yeah. Japan submitted to the US military government, and the Americans were quick to punish the former empire for its pre-war militarism. Demobilized officers of the Imperial Army were barred from certain occupations, such as government service, while the wealthy landowners who supported the war had their property seized by the Americans and redistributed to tenant farmers. But America had- Good, good. This is not communism, but it's American system. At its finest, to take the land from the rich, you give it to the poor. Sounds like communism, I know, but the US did it. Love it. Love it, love it. I love what they did to Japan. Had more discreet ways of getting what she wanted. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the CIA undertook a bevy of covert operations throughout the world in support of American foreign policy. The CIA fomented, supported, or outright incited numerous coups and regime changes throughout the post-war years. American support for the vehemently anti-communist regimes of South Korea and South Vietnam is well known, but CIA-backed revolutions also occurred in Iran in 1953 and Guatemala in 1954, among many others worldwide. The 1953 Iranian coup saw the CIA install Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. The CIA accomplished this by bribing, among others, Iranian clergy who spoke out against the previous government. The same clergy who would go on to speak out against the Shah Pahlavi and incite the Iranian revolution of the 1970s. The 1954 Guatemala coup saw both the CIA and the U.S. Ambassador to Guatemala, John Purifoy, support and direct a military overthrow of Guatemala's democratically elected government in favor of a hardline anti-communist dictatorship under President Castillo Armas. While the CIA would come to- So sometimes U.S. and the CIA would actually prefer dictators as long as they were anti-communism. Even if people democratically choose a president who is pro-communist, U.S. would actually interfere with that election and, and put their own puppet in the government that would be strongly anti-communism. Now this is a very shady deal, a very shady and bad thing to do, to interfere in another democracy, but Communism is so much worse. Communism only works on paper. It is violent shortages of everything, a lot of stealing, a lot of crime. It is as bad as it gets. So I think it is for a good reason. If some country says that their people want communism, they are lying. Nobody wants communism. It's the worst state to exist in. Judge the Armas regime as inept, despite holding near absolute power, the heads of the agency quietly congratulated each other on a job well done. This was reflective of the CIA's modus operandi, the suppression of democracy to ensure the suppression of communism. Between the areas occupied by her military and her existing possessions, America emerged from the Second World War a territorial giant. 
The yeah. US established an empire spanning from Alaska to Hawaii, from Berlin to Tokyo. With her economic growth, sudden territorial breadth, and willingness to use any means to ensure her position, America had cemented itself as the new superpower on the proverbial block. Woo! Yeah, the eagle love it. had landed. The eagle had landed, I repeat, the eagle had landed. I love the sign off. I love the Amer armchair historian. I hope you guys like it also. He has more videos I could react to, so if you want to see them, put them in the comments below. I'm so glad we are allies. Makes me glad, makes me feel safe in my country because only 100 kilometers is Russian border and the Russians are uh, one aggressive nation. So thanks to the US and NATO, I can feel safer, my family can feel safer. I can actually think about making a family in this country because I don't have to be afraid that my children will have to be will have to deal with the invasion of Russia. No, we have the US as our ally. And no Russian is going to come here un until we have the US troops stationed here. Thank you Americans. Thank you to you for existing. My friends, if you like my style, if you like my videos, consider supporting the channel through Patreon. The link is in the description below. And as always, until my next video, stay cool and bye bye.